Okay, um, good morning. I'm very excited to be here in Prague and it's the first time I'm in the city and um, thank you, Elena, Elena, all of the organizers for uh, inviting me to be here with you today. Um, I have the opportunity to um, talk to you a little bit about what is my vision of the future of organizations. But before I start, I want, you might be wondering what that picture is there. I want to introduce you to my grandparents. He's my grandmother and my grandfather, they both now passed away. But I grew up with my, with my grandmother, and when I was growing up, um, she was born in 1925. So when I, when, when I was growing up, she always told me, if you want to become somebody in life, you have to work really hard, go to school, get good marks, then after that you get a good job. If you do well, you get promoted. If you do well, you get promoted again. You stay in that company for about probably 20 years. Eventually, you'll get married, have kids, retire, and have a big pension. Little did, I, little did she know that I was actually growing up to be in a very, very different world than hers. Um, she had no idea of the world that we live in today. And certainly, a lot of the education that I received when I was growing up, and even when I was at university, no longer ago, is no longer relevant. And Yes, some of the skills that were left there still stay with me, of course, but the world is changing so fast that we are now definitely entering a new era. Yesterday morning, I woke up, I turn around, my alarm goes up, and I say, Alexa, stop. And Alexa stopped, and I said, even in bed, Alexa, please tell me what I have in my agenda today. And she told me exactly what I have to do. And I say, Alexa, please um, call an Uber for me. The taxi was, I didn't actually have to grab my phone. My Alexa is connected to my mobile and to my Uber app. 15, 20 minutes later, the taxi came to pick me up and it took me to the gym. I started my days going to the gym really early and I get into the gym and there's nobody there. My gym, I just put my fingerprints, put in a code, I enter, there's nobody in my gym. I leave the gym after I do my workout and I go to the supermarket and there's nobody in the supermarket because now I can pay myself with self-checkout machines. I leave the supermarket and head into the office. I sit in the computer and I have to do two transactions in the bank. 15 years ago, I had to go to the bank. I no longer have to the bank. I can transfer the money locally and I can even get a mortgage because I actually have got a mortgage a few weeks ago through just the telephone. Nobody has to see me in person. And this is the thing. We are already, in a way, in the age of robots. We think of robots as those machines that are out there that move and that have eyes and that look like the science fiction movie. But robots are already here and they are between us. We are already replacing humans at work with algorithms. And this is the topic that we're going to be talking today. Today we gather here to talk about HR. We talk about technology and how this is going to impact us going forward. But the reality is also that although they are here, we are just about to start a revolution, and that's what today is about. But I'm not going to bore you with everything that there is to say about artificial intelligence or what jobs will be the new jobs, because I don't want to steal the job of the other speakers throughout the day. But what I want to share with you today is what impact that might have in our life, and more importantly for HR professionals, what are the key skills that we're going to have to have to face in this new era? So today, as I said, everything is already an algorithm and it's about creating those processes and those technologies that will allow us to make work better. Now, artificial intelligence is not only an algorithm, but it's the ability to change the way how we work. This morning or every morning, you take up your phone and you do all sorts of things with the apps that are there. That is already a very advanced technology. Artificial intelligence, apart from a speech recognition, is visual recognition. We saw outside, you have seen the machine that is making the coffee, is the ability to see things and automatically react to processes. And is the ability to be here in the Czech Republic and um, going in a taxi and just dictating to my phone, to my Google Translator, where I want to go and being able to say, Dobriden. Because the, I don't even have to learn it. Sometimes those technologies will completely be wired to us as I saw in Japan just a few months ago when I was there. So what do we have is what's happening over the last few years is we're going through an era of exponential growth. This is a very simple graph, more for illustrative purposes. 
Okay, so technology is coming faster and faster and developing faster than before, and those technologies are marrying and copulating together to create biggest technologies. The growth of technology is accelerating at an incredible level, and some of you have might probably heard the term singularity. If you haven't, check it out. Singularity, we call that point where technology potentially could hit the same threat hole of knowledge and reasoning than human beings. There's a university called the Singularity University that was funded by Google and NASA, and they are based in California, and they are investigating all the impact of technology, robots, and artificial intelligence into our lives. Now, we have sometimes in our pocket more technology than we ever had before, and those tools, just a mobile phone, is a very powerful element for us to talk about. Now, what's happening is, at the moment, there are different eras, or different areas rather, of fields of knowledge that are colliding together. So before, medicine was a space of research. Before, computing was a space of research. Engineers investigating IT were only working on those machines. Doctors were working something completely separate. And what's happening is that technology, through a speech recognition, our knowledge of biology, even in medicine, and right here, we are in the Molecular Genetics Institute. We are now even able to edit genoma. So the thing is that for the first time in history, these different um, disciplines are merging together, and that's creating a huge explosion of knowledge. When we talk about the Internet of Things, it's when we talk about something that is mechanical, let's say, for, for an instance, an iron, right? or a washing machine, but the moment we implement IT technology and chips and algorithm into that washing machine and we connect it to your phone, a lot of things start to change. And what we're seeing now is exactly that bringing together of the different disciplines is going to create a massive change in what we're doing. But the basis of that, I insist, is the algorithms. The algorithm is exactly what rules that machine as opposed to just the fact that it's artificial intelligence. So tomorrow, artificial intelligence, driverless cars, robotics, we know what's coming. There's no need here for us to come and talk about it. You just can Google anything about the future and you will see everything that is about to come. But one of the key things for us to have as a reference today, what we define as artificial intelligence? Well, we all know it, but sometimes just to get a common definition, is the ability of machines to complete tasks based on different elements of training of those algorithms, and it can include many multiple disciplines. Now, what is artificial intelligence doing for us, and what are we doing for artificial intelligence? So here's the thing, a few things to, to consider. When we're starting to ask the question, are robots, is artificial intelligence going to replace humans, going to replace the work that we do in HR? That's an important question for us to consider, because not necessarily. And the, the, where I'm coming from today is the fact that job is changing. I don't think necessarily, as I said prior in my introduction, that we're being replaced. I think what is happening is we are transforming. At the moment, what we know, artificial intelligence is already amplifying, interacting, and embodying the way how we work. And this is what most of that is going to be happening. It's our amplifying our capabilities because machines can process data, analyze data much better than us. It's enhancing the way we think and the way we process the things that we process. It's now interacting with us, as we can see in the robots outside. And it's actually helping us to do the work that we do at a bigger scale. We know that we humans fail. We know that sometimes we make errors. And that exactly is what technology is allowing us to prevent. I had the opportunity to, work, to fly from Geneva to London just a year ago in the cockpit of a plane. And it was fascinating to see how the pilots did practically nothing. And they, paid a lot of, they get paid a lot of money for that, right? <laughs> but they just sat there, just coding some codes, push a button, and the plane practically flew on its own completely. Right? And this is a technology that actually is a good 10, 20, 30 years old already. Right? So what we have to see is sometimes we can trust technology more than we can trust humans. Sometimes when we're doing an analysis of data or even playing chess, the machine can actually beat humans. Why? Because the power of computing is so much powerful. 
And what we now see is that actually when we can direct that power to every single activity that we do in our profession, our jobs and our careers, that can significantly, um, in a way, guarantee success for that process. But we also have a role going forward for technology. And we are the ones who have now to maintain and sustain that technology. So our role and interaction with artificial intelligence is started to become something like this. So we have to train those robots, we have to train those computing systems, and we have to configure exactly how that technology is going to work. Those are the new jobs of the future, where we are going to all become designers. Designers of those processes, designers of those technology. But also, that technology is going to be so much powerful that they are going to start to generate insights, information, or outcomes that we are going to be able to then, or I'm going to have to explain and not only for ourselves, but to others. I might apply for a credit in a bank, and the outcome might come and say, yes, you've been approved the credit, or no, you haven't been approved the credit. And my job in that bank will now be to ensure that that information is fully explained to the customer in the right way, or what is that process done in that particular form or shape. But more importantly, also sustaining and protecting humans and helping humans to collaborate with robots. Right? So, how do we ensure that a robot in a highly production kitchen in a restaurant, for example, something that things that we see being automated very soon, is able to recognize humans, not bump into humans, like in a case of a driverless car running over somebody. So there is a big job around sustaining this technology and ensuring that this technology is actually being used purposefully. So we are both sustaining this artificial intelligence, but also the technology is enhancing our capabilities. And why should we say no to enhance our capabilities? Now, the big question, will humans be replaced? Well, here's some of my thoughts. When you look at those bullet points up there, I think there are certain activities that definitely will be replaced. And the answer to my question right here from myself is definitely yes. So when we look at things like data processing, analyzing spreadsheets, um, seeing processes where we always generate different results that are inconsistent, right? Um, basic decision making, modeling of different scenarios when you're talking about risk calculation or business uh, scenarios, business planning, all of those modeling exercises that some of us learned at university in economics or science, they will all be automated because the algorithm will be able to do them much better than us. But not only much better, but in a wider range and also even more accurate and more successful, faster than us. Why would we say no to that? But then we also have any activities that don't add value, anything that is processed in manual work. This is, has already been automated for years. Just think about farmers and how through the farming and even the manufacturing companies we've been integrating um, machines already that some of the work. This will continue. You take your phone today, you scan an invoice, and any accounting software automatically enters the data with the pay, the amount, the reason, and put into your software system. That's the kind of automation that doesn't add value, that, that the, the labor that doesn't add value to us will be fully automated. And anything that we do that machines can do faster is also potentially that will be replaced. So in my view, yes, all of the work that we're doing, or the majority of the work that we're doing, will be replaced. But the story doesn't finish there. So are you saying that, yes, will we have robots sitting here in 15, 20 years? No, because what happens is our role changes. Now, we have already been replacing, and this is not something new. Sometimes it makes me curious why people think, oh, now this is a big question that we have to ask ourselves today, and we have to have a conference to really understand if we will be replaced. We are a danger at the demise of humans. Actually, no. This has been happening, but it's happening very slowly for many years. The thing is that the scale that is happening now is much bigger. And because of that exponential growth that we saw earlier on. But these are jobs that already has been replaced, half of them, right? Um, some of that technology has been replaced. We sometimes, no longer, we still have postmen and, and, and couriers, but we no longer saw those letters to do business. We don't longer saw those memos that people have to carry. What's happening is now email have changed the way and have changed the way of many systems and many businesses as well. Now, lawyers, analysts, and doctors seems to be the next one in line because we know that systems like Watson are able to sometimes even calculate much better our diagnostics. How many cases 
of medical negligence are lawyers not debating today in courts? How many errors and people have been killed because a doctor, even highly qualified, sometimes has made a little mistake during an operation? We have machinery, like we saw just right here, that actually could do operations significantly more accurately than any of the doctors before. Maybe yes, maybe it's too soon today, but it's something that will be coming soon. Anything to do with analyst jobs. If you're in recruitment, for example, if you're in any economic analytical jobs, those are things that potentially will be very soon automated. So it's something that is not necessarily new, and I put that photo there particularly because when we think of robots, we think of that. And we think that we're going to be sitting with those things in here. And we think that we're going to have that at home, and we're going to be working in the same project with somebody like that. Maybe. But this is just a visual representation of what, in our science fiction mind, a robot looks like. A robot is just an algorithm. Technology is the most advanced way of doing something. A robot can be simply be just a spreadsheet that we use today. Before, we have to use people who calculated things. They are already here. So there's no big difference, just that this is a most accelerated stage. So what kind of jobs potentially could be replaced within HR? Certainly starting with recruitment. So we already see a lot of the recruitment process being automated with significant software where people apply, the system is scan a lot of things, and we are able to, especially if you are for a big corporation, narrow down thousands of applications into the most suitable candidates based on a particular criteria. That's already here, we all use it. But one of the things that we are also listening a lot or hearing a lot about today is also things like unconscious bias. Right? I see companies doing a lot of training around unconscious bias today. And it's because we recognize that in terms of making decisions, our mind is not 100% accurate at times. And we know that an algorithm sometimes can be make even better decisions than us. And what al the algorithm continues to evolve day by day as best lessons learned are incorporated into the algorithm until it becomes perfectly accurate. Anything to do with employment law, like Watson, is something that could potentially be automated. But even trainers, even those, one of the main things that I've been doing all my life, even trainers potentially could be automated. Why? Because the nature of learning is changing. And I just put a little slide towards the end to tell you a little more about how learning is also changing. So what I think is what we are seeing is a transformation. What we'll be seeing in the next few years is what we call a new wave of HR transformation, and that's exactly what we are going through. Now, um, what are the new jobs for the future? Well, you'll be hearing a lot of that today, I'm sure, but here are some ideas. Definitely specialists or professionals that are concerned with the user experience, and all of us, independently of the disciplines that we're in, if we're in HR, we will be coming artificial intelligent process designers. What we become is become architects of this new technology. How this new technology is going to help me to achieve the goals, the mission, the strategy of my company or the organization that I'm working for. We are in the same way that 10 years ago, we, people have to learn code to be able to do a website, and it was like a big rocket science. Any of us can open the laptop today and drag, drag, and drag and drop a few things, and we can all build a website. Technology will be exactly the same. Those big complicated algorithms that create processes that manage organizations will be as easy as a drag and drop. People say, we need to teach our kids code today. I disagree, because we don't need code now to make websites. What we need to start thinking about is actually how those kids and how those professionals are going to be architects of this technology together. Um, but the important thing is, we are social beings, and therefore, we still require human interaction, and we still require the need to be listened to, and be able to collaborate and work with each other. And that's the big transformation that also is going to happen in organizations. And I'm going to talk in a minute about the new generation and Generation Z, and what these um, kids are like, potentially. But I'm going to then close my presentation with what I think are the key skills of the future HR professionals. And one of the things that is definitely relevant there is how can we create a great place to work. With humans are actually in harmony with technology, but more importantly, able to work together in an effective way. So, I think, in my personal view, that what is happening is not a full replacement. 
this algorithm, this technology is enhancing the way we work, but it's not necessarily replacing us. If we look back in history of time, this was of us thousands of years ago. The source of the economy was agriculture. What drove what we did in society was that we organized our societies, our family life, around being able to cultivate the food that we needed. Technology came and emerged, and eventually we invented machines, and we moved to the cities, and we created factories, and then the new jobs are in those factories. And that's how our educational system emerged. Later, we, ma we master manufacturing, and then we moved to the industries of service. When you look at what the competitive advantage of companies were in the seven, late 70s, early 80s, and definitely early 90s, it was all about service. We had master production. It's about how we make a difference to compete in a very competitive market. And this is what we call, most recently, that knowledge economy. So we went from agricultural revolution to industrial revolution to what we call today a knowledge revolution. But today our knowledge and our jobs look like a little bit more like that. And probably any of you in the office looks a little bit like that. Looking at spreadsheets, making plans, analyzing risks, thinking about the future. But that is already gone. I think we are already at the verge of a new revolution or a new era, and that's what I call the economy of ideas. And before, the companies that were very successful were the ones that had a lot of assets, land, money and capital to be able to invest, grow, and grow across countries and grow globally. But today, you don't need that. Today, to make a lot of money, what you need is an idea, and probably a laptop and an internet connection. And with that, you can really rock the world with a new business. And if you don't believe me, just look at some of the most valuable companies in the world. Um, here I have some ideas. This um, is a young guy called Mark Zuckerberg, who didn't want to go to university. He dropped out at age 17. And he said, you know, I'm going to start doing some programming here. But little did he know that a few years later he will be um, selling or setting up a company that is worth around $70 billion. That has changed the world and the world how we know it today. He didn't know it at the time, but he knew that it was something different that he wanted to pursue. Another two guys set down a company called Instagram, two young teenagers maybe, started to do some code when the parents were telling them off, no, stop doing that, stop playing, go to the university, go to school, you need to you know, become somebody in life. And they insisted, and they did it probably in the free time. And a few years later, and I'm not saying 20 years later, I'm saying very few years later, they sold that company for $1 billion. They're telling you that if you want me to be successful, don't ask me to go to university. Let me pursue what I know is a new source of wealth. And these stories and the examples continue. Just look into any of these stories of these famous brands, but like, like these ones that we are recognized, that are also other organizations that we don't recognize that are a source of a lot of knowledge. And not only that, but the growth of the sharing economy is something that is also changing. Raise your hand if you, of course, know Uber or use Uber. Right. So we all know that Uber is the biggest taxi company in the world, but they own no one taxi. Right. It's a principle of sharing economy. There is an asset that is not being used. Let's share it. I develop a little app. And I became a millionaire by just developing that app. And I still haven't bought a taxi, and I don't even drive one. That's what the owner of Uber is probably telling themselves. And a similar case is with a company called Airbnb. And raise your hand if you have traveled and used Airbnb. I know that companies like the Hilton Hotels and the Marriott Hotels are having emergency meetings because the prices are dropping, because people prefer to stay in Airbnb when they travel. They're no longer using hotels. And what I'm talking about here is technology that is already here that we all use every day just to illustrate the disruption of business models. The big question is, when will your business be Uberized? Because it's a matter of time. The business model is changing as a result of that technology, and that technology is what? It's just an algorithm. That app is just an algorithm that is connecting things and being used in different platforms. I can give you other examples, but I'm not going to go into detail because it's not the purpose of today. But if you want a logo design for your company, just go to 99designs.com. Traditionally, the graphic designers will charge you $500 to design two or three logos. You might not like them. 
If you want three more options, you have to pay $500 more. Go into 99 Designs, pays 200 pounds, and you've got thousands of designers competing for that money globally. These are digital natives that are probably sitting in a beach in Thailand, and they just work, and you receive about a thousand different designs. You choose how many iterations and changes you want to the designs, and eventually you award the prize to somebody. This is changing even digital or graphic design agencies, right? I've used them, it's incredible, right? How we are now competing on a global scale. I grew up with dogs, but I can't have a dog. But somebody had this brilliant idea to set up a website called borrowmydoggy.com. And you can share your dog. It's funny, right? But I use them because I cannot have a dog. And that person has a dog, sometimes have to go and leave the dog in doggy care and pay 30 pounds a day and the dog is going to be probably unattended. I want to look after the dog while the day I'm working from home. The dog gets dropped in the morning. I book it like I book in a hotel. I'm available this day from this time. The dog arrived. The owner gave me a pack with the food and everything. I have my dog for the day. And at 6 o'clock, they come and pick him up. It's incredible. Now, it's funny, right? But this is what's happening. I'm wondering if sometimes we're going to get something like borrow my wife or borrow my husband. And <laughs> Uh, my children, yes. Um, but here's the thing. We laugh, and this is funny, but there is somebody somewhere right now, probably sitting on a beach, enjoying seeing how these people exchange dogs every day around the world and not having to work because the algorithm is working for them. And this is what our children are seeing. This is what the new generation is noticing. And if we look at the companies that before, um, 25 years ago, these are the companies that were most valuable in the world. But now, those companies have changed. It took them 100 years to get to a point, whereas these companies took them less than 20. It's totally, totally changed. How am I doing for time? I'm sorry. We are, we are in a red light, so... Okay. Right. Sorry, I didn't notice that. Um, wasn't aware of the time was here. Um, I'm just going to steal five minutes of you then to go straight into the key message here around HR skills for the future. Um, I think what we have HR leaders have to do is facilitate the agility of response to organizations, learn to navigate complexity and create a great place to work. Organizations have to be alert to every technology in every field that is happening. And we have to, it's a role and responsibility for every one of us around the organization. Be able to react really quickly and have the capability to readapt and as an organization have those, make those decisions really quickly and be ready to react. But more importantly, one of the key challenges is to be able to constantly respond to those changes. And I'm going to leave you with this. We still need to create amazing places to work. We need to remember that we are social beings. And the key is for this new generation, we need to attract talent. Talent is now global. They change jobs every year, every two years. They are recruiting you instead of you recruiting them. And it's our role to create a place where people can feel connected and engaged and come to work with us. It's about resilient and supporting them. And our role is to design those systems. And more importantly, to do in order to be agile is as professionals, we need to learn to manage the information overload that is around us already. Probably most of us have hundreds of emails every day that we sometimes can you know, struggle to cope with. And, and it's to start developing those design skills that we need to create that new technology. I'm closing with the following. This is what we, as HR professionals, need to do to embrace a new future. And I think it is about being able, not even to change, because we talk about change management a lot. We can no longer manage change. That by itself is an irony. It's about being able to create an organization where we craft and design these processes and systems to react really quickly and to change as we're going through life and, and through the business that we do. So um, 
apologies that it took me longer and I didn't spend much time in this, but my only final message to you is it's already here. We're not being replaced, it's changing. And it's our responsibility to really adapt to create these amazing places to work and create, become all designers of data and algorithms. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Ernesto. And we have, a, we have a little time because, please, please stay, stay with us, please, <laughs> because we have a, still a little time, uh, 30 seconds, maybe a little bit more, just uh, for a few questions. So if I can ask for a Slido. Jestli máte nějaké otázky přes Slido, tak poprosím, jestli tam máme tu aplikaci. A, aha, jak pracovat s různými generacemi v éře robotů? How to, how to deal, how to work with uh, uh, generation, for example, Z and uh, another, uh, in, the, in the era of robots, in the time of robots? One more time? Yes. yes. Okay. How, um, maybe maybe you can you can help me. But uh, how to how to work with uh, particular generations, Z, the millennials, and so on, uh, in the time of robots. Um, we talk a lot about millennials, and I'm not going to go into that because we kind of know already what they like. But Generation Z is a very different generation. And think about anybody that is under 18 years old today. They grew up with technology. Their brains are wired differently. Okay, so for them it's completely natural. You will see there's a funny video of a, a, a baby being two, three years old, taking a magazine and trying to go like this in a photo. Um, the, the brains are different, and um, they are perfectly comfortable working around um, this technology. I yeah, think. But for us, it's a little bit scary but, to do this. Yeah, but we think it's scary. But it was very scary for my mother to see a computer. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you are right. right? Um, so it's just a matter of really thinking that we're not changing what we do, we're changing the medium, we're changing the vehicle, we're changing the tools, but what we're doing is still the same. And there was a big um, expectation, right? When email was created and mobile phones were created and computers were created, we thought, oh, this is going to change the life and we're going to have so much free time. Do you have more free time now? <laughs> we're probably busier than before, right? So the, it's the speed just accelerates and accelerates and the nature of work changes. Our brain, both millennials generations say it will be about ideas. Mm -hmm. It'll be about taking all that information and just making better business and better process out of that. Okay, thank you. And uh, oh, which question do you like more from these three, please? We have, <laughs> we have no enough time, I'm sorry. So just one. Uh, um, I go for the, um, the, the one on the top because it go a special boat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how to manage information overload. Um, well, this is why um, resilience is such a relevant topic at the moment. I think what happens is we think that resilience is a skill that we all need to have to necessarily deal with trauma or deal with high stress. Um, but we all need resilience because resilience actually is needed in the little things of every day. It's that moment when you have 150 emails and you have a full day of work and you, you cannot even know how to cope with it. Um, it's, um, it's part of the, the way of learning. So what we're doing is trying to observe the information is difficult and sometimes it's unmanageable. So what we need to learn is to learn on the spot, use the minimum required and that's what learning systems that are on demand, on demand bite size and with like, different channels of learning are the way forward. That's one of the works that we've been doing recently in a big banking organization, is completely transform the removal of training courses as we know them, ILTs, into a completely what we call a training compass. And a training compass is just identifying small tiny clusters of knowledge and scatter them all around so when people need something, like in Google, do you school something, get it, just in an instance. Okay, so and please, uh, maybe, maybe the last question, who is the major opponent to robotization? The, the, the first, first one. one, who is the major opponent to robotization? Um, I think there are some groups of humanists um, out there that probably are thinking that robots are going to completely change like in science fiction movies and going to wipe um, the human you know, race. I think it's very difficult for us to identify who are the, the opponents. I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't call them opponents. I think my people, uh, there might be people who might be resistant to welcoming them. But the reality is, like mobile phones and email, eventually they'll take over. And it's a matter of 
a gradual understanding of that. I don't think necessarily that there are any uh, opposition. In some organizations, there will be uh, um, unions and syndicates of workers that might start to stand up against being replaced, but that's where organizations will have responsibility to, to retrain people to be of added value in different areas. Thank you very much. I think we will speak about it uh, more today. Thank you very much, Enjoy Ernesto Moreno.